Shalom. Peace to you, my brothers and sisters, friends from wherever you're watching and whenever you're watching. Greetings. I hope this finds you doing well and abounding in the grace of God, abiding in the love of our Lord. And let me start by saying I want to correct something. Last time I was a little embarrassed. I was trying to say docetism, and I said doceticism, and I incorrectly added this little uh, extra, extra syllable right there. Doceticism, and actually, when you do that, it changes the, it changes where the accent goes. Doceticism instead of docetism, and I said, well, uh, that's a word too, though, as though I was getting it confused with a real world word, and I was. I was confusing it with the word asceticism, but docetism is not a real word. So I know that's that's my bad. I'm sure you were you were deeply concerned about all of that and couldn't wait to tell me. All right, I hope you have your beverage at hand. Let me just show you one more thing for our little fun intro. We need to get rolling. This just came up recently in my Time Hop app. It shows you something on this day, you know, last year or the year before or wh however many years before. It's a really cool thing. And this was in my Photos app on my phone. This was from four years ago. This is our backyard looking out from our deck in the backyard in our home in Virginia. That's the chair where I used to sit and read scripture and pray a lot on a little bridge over a creek that we had there. But uh, look how it was coming down. And this was uh, a look out our front door. We were at the end of a cul-de-sac here. And this is um, just outside of Richmond, Virginia. So, But here in the Houston area, I have to admit, it is kind of nice when you can just wear a t-shirt and jeans out on uh, a day like today. We're having beautiful weather right now. Had a little bit of a cold spell, but it's going to get typically warm again here in the Gulf Coast. And so we'll enjoy that. Okay, so as we discuss these issues uh, of historical context that we always need to do when we're examining a document in Scripture and looking at these basic questions of who, what, where, when, why, and all of that, uh, we want to finish this up, and I need to include something that I left out last time. I just want to get it in here this might drive my note takers crazy, but it should be in the notes in the file that I'm going to upload from last week and this week. I'll upload these files and you'll have them there. But let me show you. So as we were talking about the writer being the, the disciple, identified as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and we I, I didn't really spend much time on these other possibilities, um, but we settled on the, the, the traditional view, son of Zebedee. And on this chart, we talked about uh, the internal evidence for that is consistent with John the Apostle, the son of Zebedee, the brother James. Um, and I left this out. I thought it was, it was kind of blank and it just didn't seem right. But I left this out. I never did pull up this one here. That another evidence is that um, whoever wrote this was closely associated with Peter, and John is clearly closely associated with Peter. In those texts you see right here, if you take a look at those texts in John 13, Peter leans over to John and asks John to ask Jesus who the disciple was that would betray him. 
So there you have Peter asking John to ask the Lord something. And then in chapter 18, John gets Peter into the court of the high priest. In chapter 20, they both go running together to the tomb. You remember that? And John outruns Peter. But when he gets to the tomb, uh, when John gets to the tomb, uh, Peter, when he catches up, runs right past him into the tomb. And so that's very interesting. But they run there together. So they, they were apparently friends. And Luke mentions that it was Peter and John the Lord sent to make preparations for them to eat the Passover meal. And you see them together then after the resurrection and the ascension and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 and in Acts chapters 3 and 4. It's Peter and John they sent together to Samaria. Paul mentions in Galatians 2.9 that they were pillars in the church. So I think that's good information for you to have as we're thinking about the evidence, the internal evidence for the Johannan authorship of this gospel that bears his name. Now, something that I passed over that I want to spend just a couple minutes on, I think it's important for us to be aware of this, as we think about evidence for Johannan authorship, there are doubts about whether it really is John the Apostle who wrote the gospel that bears his name, the fourth gospel, and the letters attributed to him. And that's and these doubts, I think, are substantial enough to prevent us from being absolute, absolutely dogmatic that we know that John, the apostle John, wrote the book of John and that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I'm pretty confident in that, but be aware, for example, that when you look, you take a close look at John, it does appear to have been written in stages and compiled together. And so some will say that means it was composed by multiple authors in the Johannine community, and then the different pieces written by the different authors were put together. Now, why in the world would we say that or even pause to wonder about this or include it in our study? Well, Look at the fact that you have a very distinct prologue, and in the prologue, you know, some think the prologue may have been an early Christian hymn. And in the prologue, you have some key words, some big terms representing some big concepts that you do not find anywhere else in John, like logos, uh, word, and that he tabernacled, chapter 1 and verse 14, the fullness of chapter 1, verse 16, and reference to grace. That's the only time that word appears. Chapter 1 and verse 16, again, we see, receive from him grace upon grace. And then you have John seems to end at chapter 20. It wraps up very nicely. And then you have this epilogue that seems to have been tacked on. So I wouldn't dismiss this idea right out of hand as long as we recognize the final product we have in our Bibles is what the Holy Spirit wants there, what we have in the canon of the New Testament, but it may help us to be aware of some of these things as we look at the book. For example, there are some awkward transitions in John that are hard to explain. And this, see, when I first read John as a new Christian, this really puzzled me. In chapter 14 and verse 31, Jesus is talking to the disciples in the upper room where you have this farewell discourse, as it's commonly called. And what does, he, what does he say to them there? After he finishes in chapter 14, verse 31, he says, Rise and let us go from here. And then after he says that, he continues to talk for several more chapters. He says, All right, let's go. And then he keeps talking as though they haven't moved at all, chapter 15, 16, and 17. And then when you get to chapter 18, they move on. And so it looks like someone added on there to what was an ending from what one person compiled. That's uh, certainly possible. And then you have these we passages in the book. This is, this is very interesting, too. Because look at, for example, the most famous is probably um, 
in chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And I've got the text right here. And Jesus chastises him a bit in verse 10. Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? And then here's one of the several truly trulys in the book. That's something distinctive to John's gospel. Um, he says, truly, truly, I say to you. Now Jesus is talking to, Nic to Nicodemus here. And he says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you, and that you there is plural, actually. So, but you guys, as we would say back in the Northeast and Western New York, but you guys do not receive our, see, then we're back to uh, this first person plural. So what are we to make of that, that Jesus is all of a sudden talking about, you know, we and our? Well, uh, is it possible that, the reference here is to the Jehannan community and the things that they were facing at that time. I think that's possible. So you have, uh, whoops, so you have these awkward transitions, and somehow I got rid of by accident, excuse me, <clears throat> I got rid of the, the little bullet point here. Let me find it here. Let's see if I can find it. Well, about we, there it is. I apologize here. And I could redo this slide, but I don't, don't think I'm going to do that. So, But the we passages, that's something to, and that doesn't mean little tiny passages, but l look for with me, for example, now at this, at the end of the book of John. Notice in chapter 21, when he talks about Jesus speaking to Peter about the way that he would be martyred, and then Peter says, well, what about John? What about him? What about, I'm assuming John, but what about this disciple whom Jesus loved? And Jesus says, well, in verse 23, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? But then in verse 24, here we've got it again, right? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written about these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So you see it? And so we know it, this testimony is true. Uh, now, I think this, that it could just be the editorial we, sort of like when a husband might say, hey, we're pregnant. And um, really that's not the editorial we so much it, as it is a, a kind of use of the first person plural known as the pluralis modestiae. And I just put that in there for, for you, Rose. See, we got our Latin in, but that's, that's the author's we when it's a it, common practice when you might say you add four to five and we get nine uh, or something like that. I saw that example somewhere. Or you say, how are we feeling today? You know, the nurse walks into the room, says to the patient, in the hospital bed. How are we feeling today? Well, and so you can have that kind of editorial we. We're pregnant, by the way. We are pregnant. Our daughter, Jessica, is expecting our fifth grandson. Yes, we're very excited about that. Here he is, another little boy. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. But anyway, think about that, that objection that you have these we passages and the awkward transitions and all that, the things there that we were just talking about. And there is good reason to believe the gospel of John arose in a specific cultural, a distinctive cultural environment, a distinct community that had specific concerns had very specific concerns that the Johannan literature addresses. And I say not, not the Gospel of John, but the Johannan uh, literature, because I'm including here 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the, the epistles, okay? But, but, 
even so, we can acknowledge that, but I think still speculating about stages of composition and various authors that may have helped compile it and the cultural context that may have influenced them, that's important and insightful when you're looking at uh, certain themes running through the text. But remember, a lot of that's highly speculative, and w our concern is, well, how does the book appear as we have it in our, in our Bibles, in the canon, the canonical form? That's, uh, that's what we mean here by that. And it's similar to think of the book of Job. I think there's some issue whether the Elihu speeches were originally a part of the book of Job. But even if they weren't, at some point they were added to the book of Job and the, the book of Job as we have it today is how it is in the Old Testament canon that Jesus recognized in his day. So uh, just be aware that we can't be, I, I, I think all of this shows we, we aren't going to be absolutely dogmatic and say we know for a fact that John, the Apostle John, wrote the fourth gospel. But I'm going to refer to the writer as John. It's my conviction that John wrote this gospel. And I think we can be fairly certain of that, but not absolutely certain of it. Uh, then also, when I mentioned, as we thought about where, or what is the providence, as it's referred to, the place from which the book was written, and we mentioned Ephesus, uh, bear in mind that Ephesus fits... It fits both the uh, Hellenistic context where we see these sort of Greek philosophical themes influencing what we have in the Gospel of John. So it certainly fits that context, and it would fit the Jewish context as well. We said the fourth Gospel is a very Jewish Gospel, maybe even more so than Matthew, right? But, it's, uh, but Ephesus would fit that, wanted to squeeze that in as well. All right, so looking at these questions, who, what, where, when, why, we are going to pay special attention or focus some concern here on the why, the why of the Gospel of John. Why, what is the purpose for which the book was written? That's what we're moving into now, very important point. So to remind you where we are, because we've looked at a lot already, we addressed the importance of the, the Gospel of John and these questions of historical context, and we're looking now specifically, I know you could include this under the why in historical context, but we're looking at the purpose, and you notice, really I've got it in the plural here, the, the purpose is for which, because as we've seen with all the Gospels, there isn't necessarily one specific reason for which a particular part of Scripture has been composed. So there are multiple things to look at here. What are the purposes for which John wrote this Gospel? And as we look at this, we, we recognize, of course, that all of Scripture was written for all people in all times and places. But still, we want to keep in mind the particular occasion or the original purpose, the original situation being addressed in a given biblical document because that's going to unlock, that's going to be a hermeneutical key for really understanding what we're reading. And so that this is important to keep in mind that when you read John, he is addressing issues, these concerns and issues that the Johannine community was dealing with, okay? What were they? Well, opposition from the Jewish community. And you have over and over in John's Gospel, I think I've mentioned this already, but you have over and over John will refer to the Jews, the Jews, which is strange because Jesus was a Jew and his disciples were Jews. So how can you talk about the people who were opposing him as the Jews when they were all Jews, all the lead characters in it, including Jesus himself? Well, he's 
apparently writing at a time when the Christians were now distinct, the believers are d distinct from the Jewish community, and so the writer's thinking of them as distinct and referring to them as the Jews, really. In John's Gospel, that's a reference mainly to the Jewish leaders or to those who were not friendly to Jesus, those who were opposing him. And when you read John's Gospel, one of the unique things about it is unlike the synoptics where you have aphorisms and, and parables and things like that, in, in John, Jesus is engaging in lengthy debates, and he's doing that with with the, uh, with the Pharisees, the Jews. And so you see that in uh, chapter 5. And look, you have these long discussions. You have this uh, debate with the Jewish leaders that ends with them wanting to kill him for blasphemy in chapter 6 with those who came to him after he fed the multitude with the loaves and fishes. And, and, and his speech to them is so objectionable that many stop following Jesus at that point. And you have the same sort of thing coming up uh, at the feast in, in chapter 7 when Jesus is in Jerusalem and you see uh, 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 the, the discussion that ensues at chapter 8 though especially. Wow! Chapter 8 um, is a heated exchange. Jesus tells them, you're of your father, the devil. And they, they're so enraged at the end of that. And at the end of that debate, they pick up stones to kill him. And then in chapter 10, once again, the issue comes up of uh, blasphemy of Jesus claiming to be divine, claiming to be God. But, but you see how it's apparent that there is hostility, there is debate there is opposition from the Jewish community, and so the, the church is having to defend herself. And so John includes what, what is going on or what went on with Jesus in those discussions because that's now what is happening in the Jewish community at the end of the, fir end of the first century. Notice the frequent or rather the several references to being put out of the synagogue something like what uh, might be referred to in some religious context as excommunication, as in Roman Catholicism. But this idea of being put out of the synagogue, very serious. That's where th that you were basically being expelled from your community. And the life of the community was all centered around the synagogue. And this is a punishment that comes up really later in, uh, in the time of this community in, in the late first century from which John is writing. So there you see it. Uh, it. It seems anachronistic almost when you see it in John's gospel. And then too, uh, keep in mind that because of this, rather, because of this, John's gospel sadly has often been abused to support vicious anti-Semitism. Just it's it's terrible to think of of that. But you know, Jesus telling the Jews in chapter 8, 44, uh, you're of your father the devil. And where they say to Caesar, we we or they say to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. And these kinds of things, I know in Matthew, it's in Matthew where you find the, the Jews saying to, to Pilate, his blood be on us and on our children. And that was used to justify vicious and violent persecution of the Jews that, that is absolutely sinful and contrary to the ethic of Christ and the teaching of Christ. But bear in mind that John's gospel, because of what you see with Jesus and the things he's saying to the, to the Jews, that it has been used to support anti-Semitism because there is so much hostility against Jesus from the Jews and so much rebuke of the Jews by Jesus. And let me just include this, uh, this reference here from, from Powell who says, and maybe I can just put it on the screen if I clear everything out. I could do that, I suppose, here. Let's, let's try that. Uh, I hadn't intended to do this, so bear with me when I 
Okay, let me, let me include this great citation from Powell who says, and I have it over here in the margin. I was just going to read it, but that'd be kind of boring for you. You can look at it here with me. Uh, he says, where I've circled it in green, that, that John's gospel, starting uh, right here, John's gospel attempts both to appropriate the traditions of Israel from the emerging sect and to reorient the movement away from the Hebraic world of its past toward the Hellenistic world that represents its future. All right, I'll let you think about that, but I agree with that, and I think it's a great assessment. But then talking about uh, these concerns of the Johannine community, remember that's, that's what we're what we're referring to here. Not only were there concerns about uh, from, from the Jewish opposition, but also you can see clearly John is writing to counter the threat of, of Greek philosophy, of false Greece, Greek philosophy that was influencing the church at that time. And I, I say here to counter the threat of, of a nascent Gnosticism, meaning, you know, it was, it was just forming at that time and it would eventually in the second century develop into this full-blown sect of the Gnostics. But you see the beginnings of it even during the end of the apostolic era. So John clearly writes to counter nascent Gnosticism and its heresy about the nature of Christ. And so that's why in the prologue he uh, affirms that Jesus came in the flesh and we beheld him. He was God in the flesh. And in chapter 20, after the resurrection, clearly Jesus has a fleshly body, the same fleshly body that went into the tomb because there was a denial that Jesus, the Messiah, was actually in a material body that was a part of the docetism that I, I mentioned earlier. And you, you get clues from that even in John's letters. Uh, you see in 1 John, John talks about we saw him and our, eye, our eyes beheld him, our hands handled him. You see, because there were people who thought his body was just an illusion. And in chapter 4 of 1 John, he even insists that um, uh, those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh are antichrist and, and you're not of God if you don't affirm that. You see that again, uh, again in chapter 5 and in 2 John Seven, who, who is a deceiver and a liar, but the, the one who does not acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh. This is the kind of thing that you're finding in John's letters. But also because the Gnostics, that's from the Greek word, the term itself is, is from the, the Greek word gnosis for knowledge. And because they, they claim to have a special knowledge, this esoteric uh, idea of these elites, that they had insight into spiritual realities. They were the ones who knew the real truth that was necessary to be free. And that's why, John, I believe that's why you see so many references in John's gospel and carrying right over into the letters. Remember the same themes that you see in the gospel of John, you'll find them repeated again and emphasized, uh, several of them are emphasized over and over in the epistles of John. But he's over and over, you have John uh, affirming um, that we know, you see reference to knowing and to knowledge. And I've listed a lot of verses there that we're, we don't have time to look at individually. But you know, especially in chapter 8, verse 32, if you abide in my word, you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And uh, there's so many in the, in the letters of John, but John, in 1 John 2, 20 and 21, he says, I'm, I'm not writing you because you don't know the truth, because you do know the truth, and you've got an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. Because they were being intimidated, apparently, in the thinking they didn't know what they needed to know in order to be saved. And John wants to reassure them over and over and over. You notice I've got highlighted here as well, 2 John 1. And this is where John just comes out right here is, is what I'm referring to. 
And here in, in 2 John, John just comes out and, and says, to uh, the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, he says, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. So along with that knowing, you have many references in John's gospel to the truth and what is true, and we know what is true. See, that's why you find that again and again and again in John and in the letters of John because of this problem of Gnosticism uh, and this claim of knowledge, and, and you have something very distinctive here about John's writings, his contribution to Scripture, and that's because what he is writing is being shaped by the environment in which he's writing and the needs of the original community that he was addressing. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about how this is very valuable to us for the concerns that we're facing, that we're addressing as the church, as the church in our day. But you can see how clearly these are issues that were facing those to whom John first wrote. So in addressing these concerns, it's clear that John defines the boundaries of orthodox of orthodoxy. That's how we're going to say it there. I know that sounds highfalutin and like I'm trying to be smartical or whatever, but that's just a good way to say it. You know, the borders, the boundaries, what constitutes what we need to believe. And you can't go outside of this. If you do, then you're not of the truth. If you do, then you're not of God. That's the kind of language John uses over and over, especially in his letters. But it starts in the Gospel of John to define the boundaries of orthodoxy concerning the nature of Christ and, and now the character of his followers because the Gnostics, in their elitism, they had a total uh, condescending disregard for others. They, they were cold and unloving and actually because they, they didn't think the, the flesh actually affected the spirit. They had this kind of dualistic idea that the material environment, you had the material environment and the spiritual environment and what you did in the body didn't really affect the, the soul, the spirit. That's my understanding of uh, uh, an element of Gnostic heresy. And so they thought they could just sin and walk in sin, walk in the lust of the flesh, and it wouldn't really affect their spirit because they had this superior knowledge and all of that. And so John, you see how John talks again and again about they had this cold condescension and elitist attitude. And he says, you know, those who are of God love those who are born of God and love one another. So he latches on to what Jesus said about love. Remember, John's the apostle of love because he's the one who tells us the most. We'll get to this later when we look at the themes of John, but we're already seeing it here. We know, of course, there's a lot of overlap as you discuss these categories, but John seizes on what Jesus said about love for one another and brings it up again and again, and he clearly makes a distinction between in John you you know you either confess Christ or and you you acknowledge Christ and therefore acknowledge God or you are rejecting him and actually I think I've got the wrong yeah um, let me get the rest of this up here for you um, but I, I'm not going to go through all of those uh, but it is you see it very powerfully in first John 4 2 and Three, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. But he makes it very clear. Here's the confession that you must make in order to be of God, and those who do not confess that and those who deny that, they're not of God. But then also, uh, as I said, additionally to the nature of Christ, addressing the nature of Christ, he addresses the character of Jesus' disciples and his followers and the love that they should have for one another. And uh, see, I got ahead of myself here, and I've got that on this next point. But that was, again, because of the concern over false teachers and deceivers, 
excluding them. And so there, there was, you had division, and John wants to encourage the, the, the true followers of Christ. He wants to encourage love and unity among the faithful, among the faithful, and to expel and avoid those who are advocating this heresy. For example, you see in 1 John 2, and actually, wait, I should have uh, the, I should have the epistle here for you, but this is 1 John. All right, 1 John 2, 18 and 19, he talks about those who went out from us. They went out from us. In 2 John, he talks about how we cannot, in 2 John 7 through 10, cannot receive, bid God speed. Some translations say we can't give a greeting to or help along uh, those who are not confessing the doctrine of, of Christ, who are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. In, in, third, in third John, he, he's addressing Diotrephes and how Diotrephes was throwing some people out of the church. So you've got John saying there's some people you need to throw out of the church and avoid if, if they're not being faithful to the, to the true doctrine about Christ. And then he, he's addressing those among the heretics who were being so divisive. So there's a right kind of division and a wrong kind of division, in other words. But through it all, he stresses love for one another, that, that he takes what you have Jesus saying in the Gospel of John, that this is the defining feature in John, as John tells us about Jesus. The defining feature of Jesus' followers is that they love one another, right? John 13, 34, and 35, by, by this... All men shall know you're my disciples if you love one another. And he talks about that being a new commandment. And then that carries over, that exact theme then carries over into the letters. Just be, be, be aware of that. And there are a lot of passages I didn't even list there. But again, that goes back to what the concerns were uh, facing the Johannine community to which this letter, this gospel to whom, I should say, that this gospel was originally addressed. And of course, all of that is beneficial to us. But more broadly, John is writing to provide evidence, and that evidence comes in the form of the signs. John refers to Jesus' miracles as signs. He, he doesn't use the word miracle in his gospel. They're always called signs. They're pointing you to something. Over and over he mentions this testimony that he's giving as though he is lining up these witnesses and he himself is one of them and giving you, he's an eyewitness and he's giving his testimony so that he's presenting his case. This is what the gospel of John does. It prevents the case to lead us to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, he's going to say, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you can have eternal life in his name. You know, why should I believe that Jesus is the Christ? John is, is telling you why you should believe. He's giving you the, the evidence here. We're going to come back to that. It's an extremely important point. I love that he says that here, and he makes it explicit. This is unique to John, where when you talk about the purpose for which a given book of the Bible is written. And, you know, we, we may speculate, as we've been doing here, and we, we think about it carefully, and then we offer some possible reasons that this writer told us what he did. John comes right out, though, and tells us explicitly. Notice in chapter 19 and verse 35, and we can be certain about the reasons for which which John wrote, uh, absolutely, because he tells us. What does he say? Chapter uh, 19 and verse 34, after the soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and, and at once there came out blood and water. What does John then say? He who saw it 
has borne witness and his testimony is true. Look at all of these key concepts in his book, this idea of testimony. There, I remember I said, look for uh, this idea of truth and what is true and knowing. And he says, and he knows that he is telling you. See, he's referring to himself in the third person. Again, just an, an editorial tool, a rhetorical device. He says, and he knows that he is telling the truth. Ah, why? Why? That you also may believe. See, John just comes right out. I love it because he's the only gospel where he just comes right out and says, hey, I'm writing this because I want you to believe so that you'll have life in his name. And then in chapter 21, let's look at that here. Let me pull this off. Then in chapter 21, he says, um, after the discussion that Jesus had with Peter, and then he says, uh, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. Notice that there's a lot of repetition in John of themes. Bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and there's that we, and we know that his testimony is true. So he keeps telling you, I'm a witness to these things, and I'm writing them because uh, I want you to know that it's true. It's really true so that you can believe it. Before we look at that other text, chapter 20, that key text, this idea that you know he's telling you at a couple of points, hey, and I saw this, I was there. He's referring to himself in the writing. It, it reminds me, and it's been likened to actually, this the famous Norman Rockwell painting from the Four Freedoms in the Freedom of Want, this iconic image of uh, the family gathered around the table, the Thanksgiving table, and uh, the wife is about to put the turkey on the table and everyone is so animated in it. But what do you see down here, right here, right down here in the corner? There's, you see there's someone looking out at, uh, you know, almost kind of winking to the person viewing the scene like, uh, hey, sort of like, almost like a photo bomb. We think of a photo bomb today, right? Uh, I think that's very uh, interesting. And you see that uh, imitated over and over when people try, let me leave it here, people try to uh, reproduce this. I think it's really fun to notice. For example, Tony Bennett did it with his band, uh, the, the Count Basie big band, in his uh, Christmas album. <laughs> the, but, but notice down there in the bottom right corner, and everyone's looking at the camera there, so they're, they're not trying to be, produce it exactly. But look at these other, real, really quickly, these others that I found that I think were very interesting. Uh, you have a Disney version, but again, down in the bottom corner, so, uh, one of the characters is looking out the camera. Same with the Peanuts. Snoopy is the one down in the front right corner. Uh, uh, looking out at the viewer. Um, here's one I thought was uh, hilarious because it was for 2020. What's she serving up there? Uh, yeah, it's the corona virus. Uh, <laughs> pretty interesting. And then here's one that tr tries to make it updated for and more inclusive of all the different ethnicities in American culture. I actually like that one. Uh, and maybe have some objections to certain things, but I love, uh, when I, actually, I don't, I don't know, it's hard to object to anything there. It's just, a, that's a great reproduction, and there's, of course, well, my point is, what, what do you see down front in the corner there? You always see the person who is looking out at the camera when people make, uh, make a parody of that. Here's another one. Look down in the bottom right corner. Yep, that's what that's the iconic look. Uh, and then there's yet another one. Here you have more Asian and Hispanic representation. But look how well, uh, look how well. I'll, you can pause it and compare. And then uh, <laughs> that one I thought was kind of interesting too. But, and this one includes the original uh, person from the original Rockwell painting. Well, anyway, that's what, sort of what John is doing there. John's like taking a peek at us at certain points of the way and said, hey, I'm talking to you. Here I am, the writer, and I'm talking to you. 
that makes that's one of the many things that makes John's gospel so distinctive, so fascinating, so personal. It makes such a personal appeal to us. Do we realize that about John? That God, God is making that appeal through the writer, and I, I believe the writer's John. But whomever God used to write this, he is He's turning and looking at you at certain point as, you, as you're reading the, the gospel. He's sort of turning and looking at you and saying, you know, I, I wrote this so you'll believe, Tyler. Wow. Wow. And, of course, here's the big check, uh, text. You need to memorize this from chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And what does he say? There are many other signs Jesus did. All right, there's that. I'm giving you these signs, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe John's gospel is the gospel of belief. Well, what, what does he want us to believe? He wants us to believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the Son of God and all that he tells you about what that means in his gospel. Oh, we're going to get to that. And so that by believing, ultimately, then the aim is for you to have life and in John's gospel, that's eternal life, eternal blessedness, ultimate life, so that you can have life in his name. That's all, those are all things we're going to explore in due time. Patience, my friend. Now watch this. This is important, that, that John, he does not want to lead us to in, embrace it with you know, credulity, but he is wanting to persuade us with proof, not a blind faith. I love this about John's gospel because so many people have this idea that the faith, this came up in social media recently with me and uh, an old friend from way back in high school, the guitarist for the rock band that I played in, the garage band that I was in, and um, haven't seen him in years, but he was interested in knowing about my faith, and he made a comment to the effect that, uh, well, I, I know you just believe because you, you just want to have faith. People have this idea that it's just, there, there's no real evidence that provides a basis for the object of our faith. It's just that people just think, and, and the tragedy is that many who claim to be Christians, many believers think that, that this is what Christians, Christian faith is, that it's not actual certainty we can't really know it's just sort of a, a leap a, a blind leap in the dark where we just go to r jump out and accept something that's beyond the evidence and sometimes people misunderstand what Jesus was saying to Thomas they think that what he said to Thomas uh, proves this idea that uh, we're blessed if we just believe without really knowing, without really having the evidence. What did, he, what did he say to Thomas? You remember in chapter 21, he, uh, chapter 20 rather, he says, you know, Thomas, put, put your finger here. See my hands and, and put your hand and place it in my side and, and do not disbelieve but believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, we're going to get to that. Great confession of Jesus deity. But Jesus said to him, this is what I think people misconstrue, well, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And unfortunately, what people think that means is blessed are those who don't really know because they haven't actually seen it in person themselves and yet will believe anyway. No, 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 that's not uh, what Jesus is, is saying at all. He uh, is providing evidence, and you see that again and again in John's gospel. I love his gospel for this reason. Let, let's look at a couple of these verses quickly. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, John already gives us this sort of insight, or rather this emphasis, I should say, when, when, when it comes out of the mouth of one of the characters in the story, when verse 2 Nicodemus says to him, Rabbi, we know, notice, we know that you are a teacher come from God. How, how could they know that? 
for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. So, right at the beginning of John's Gospel, already we see that the signs should be leading us in, in the same way to certainty. The eyewitness testimony of these signs that John is writing should lead us to know who Jesus really is. Look at what Jesus says in his discussion with the, the Jewish leaders in John chapter 5. I love this. He says, uh, not that, verse 34, not that the testimony I receive is from man. He, he's saying, John bore witness to me. But he's saying, you know, really, uh, as much as I, that, that is testimony that is pointing to the truth, I, I have testimony directly from God. That's what Jesus is getting at here. But he talks about John here, and, but then he says in verse 36, but, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John for the works. And in John's gospel, Jesus' miracles, that's the way uh, he talks about Jesus' miracles. He refers to them as the works that Jesus is doing. So Jesus says, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, they bear witness. Notice again how we're seeing that over and over. They bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And that uh, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. And so this text right here, what a, what a great text there. Uh, and we're going to see that again. Let's look at chapter 10. In chapter 10, in this discussion with the Jews, as John frames it, uh, and they thought Jesus was guilty of blaspheming, blaspheming because he said, I'm the Son of God. Well, if in the absence of evidence to prove that, it, it would be blasphemous if it weren't true, but he's giving evidence to prove it. But I love what Jesus says here. It's so counter to the appeals that people make today to blind faith, um, that you just, just believe just because. No, Jesus says, Notice, if I, if I am not doing the works, and there's that term again, right? He's talking about the miracles. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe. If there's not sufficient evidence, if I'm not providing the proof, then Jesus said, you shouldn't believe in me. Then don't believe. But if I do them, now even though you do not believe in me based on the other uh, Jesus' own claim and, of course, other, other things that Jesus has presented. Um, for example, the testimony of John back, back in chapter 5. Believe the works. Believe the works. Even if you don't believe me, believe the works. Why? Here it is. Wow. That you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. See? The works provide the evidence so that you can know who I really am. And basically he says in, in chapter 7 that um, if anyone really wills to do the Father's will, he'll know. He'll know. So this theme comes up over and over again in John. Notice in chapter 15 when Jesus is talking to the disciples, to his own disciples in that farewell discourse that begins in chapter 13, goes all the way through chapter 14, through chapter 15, 16, and then Jesus' prayer with them in chapter 17. But he tells them, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now, this is the point, if you don't believe, see, you have no excuse. It's like what Paul says in Romans 1.20. God's prevent, provided the evidence of himself so that when people stand before God, if they don't believe in him, they're, they're without excuse. And Jesus is saying that here. They, they have no excuse for their sin. That, by the way, I know I passed by that kind of quickly, but that's Romans 1 and verse 20 for those note takers who want to know what passage I was referring to there. But Jesus continues, whoever hates me, he says, uh, hates my father also. 
Now, here, this is what I'm getting at, but because of my OCD, I, I, I need to fix this one. I didn't like the way it looked. All right, he says, notice, um, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, the miracles that he did, they were unprecedented, that no one else did. There's no one has ever been able to work these signs. Um, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen but they didn't believe. Then they've hated. Instead, they've hated both me and my father. And why? Well, Jesus said, because the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. See, if people re refuse to accept who Jesus is, they, they, they don't have grounds for that. They do not have grounds for that. They are um, without excuse because the works, the proof has been provided. That's what John is saying over and over in his gospel. And I love that because, uh, you know, we, we live in such a secular society and people are conditioned to be skeptical of religion and religious faith. And they think the Christ, they have total misunderstanding of the nature of the Christian faith and think that it is just a blind faith. As I said, many Christians think that. No, I love John because he's saying, look, and I say this to people about some of the things I'm teaching them when I'm trying to convert people or I'm dealing with new Christians and say, hey, if you don't see this in the Bible, if it's not there, don't believe it. Because I don't want anybody to believe something just because I say it or because they want it to be true, but because they can know that it's true because the evidence is there. Our faith is grounded in the certainty of because of the evidence that the Lord has provided us, and He's provided it, as John said, through the testimony of the eyewitnesses that, are, that is preserved for us and recorded for us. And John says, these things are written for you so that you can believe and so that you can have life in His name. It's so great, isn't it? And really, this, this evidence is being presented by John in order to call us to decision. You know, that's a purpose for which John is writing, to call us to decide based on the evidence there, that, that we have to look at what Jesus is saying. For example, and I have it written really small here, really tiny text, but the, what I just mentioned a moment ago, that if you really will to do the Father's will, you'll know. The question is, do you will to know God and to do His will? Will you be honest with the evidence because you do truly want to do what is right, because you do truly want to know God? So notice here, I've got chapter 11, verse 26, where Jesus says to Martha as she's grieving at the loss of her brother Lazarus who has died, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. One of the great I am statements, verse 25, whoever believes in me, though he die, Yet he shall live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. But then, then he says, do you believe this? And I think you can see that in what John is saying to us as the readers. Okay, I've written these things that you, will, that you might believe. I'm giving my witness, my testimony, so that I saw it, and I know it's true, and I want you to know, and I want you to believe. Now, will you? Do you believe? What Jesus asked Martha there is really what the Gospel of John asks all of us. So it's a call to decision. And John's Gospel presents to us uh, you know, the choice we have to make. And there is no other option. There is no other way to have life. You see, it's, uh, it, it's, this Gospel is exclusive. It's emphatically ex exclusive. And you'll see what I mean here by the passages uh, that we're going to look at look at here, but but John's gospel tells us, you know, we're either going to believe that Jesus is the the Son of God, and we're either going to accept that testimony and have life, or we're going to be lost, or else we're, the wrath of God is going to continue on us. It's it's a highly exclusive gospel in the sense that the claims that Jesus is making, you can see. Uh, really present an ultimatum between two choices, and there's no middle ground. I mean, just look at several of these texts with me. 
in chapter 3 and chapter 3 and verse 36, he just says it plainly. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son, I like that, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I mean, those are your choices. Believe in the Son and have eternal life or remain under the wrath, the condemnation of God. Wow. And then look at, I know we're at the one hour mark here, hopefully you've been watching on double speed or one and a half speed, but in chapter 14 and verse 6, what does Jesus say? I am, this is the fame, one of the famous I am statements, one of the more familiar ones. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And notice he says, I'm, I'm not a way. Uh, that rhymes with pay way, which reminds me how hungry I am. I am, I am not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. And here it is, no one, he says, and therefore no one comes to the Father but by me except through me. Look how exclusive that is. There is no other way of salvation. That is so offensive to people in our culture to say that no, no, if people are, are devout Muslims from the Christian perspective, no, they cannot be saved. In Hinduism, in Buddhism, in, in idolatry, in, in, uh, in New Age philosophy, in, in, in their, their moralism or uh, just being a good person or whatever. No, there's no other way to the Father. There's no other way to have life. There's no other way to be saved. That's the way John is presenting Jesus in this gospel. Remember, John's the, John's the apostle of love. He's commonly referred to in that way. Uh, let me clear the, my pet, the board here and look at another passage. This is the gospel of love. John is the, the, the one who writes so much about love, and yet he's telling us how exclusive Jesus' claims are in, uh, whoops, I already had that, this is, this is the one I meant, in chapter 12, uh, Jesus comes right out and says, the, the one who rejects me, verse 48, has one who judges him. The one who does not receive my word, who rejects me and does not receive my word, has a judge. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So you reject me, you're going to, essentially what Jesus is saying is you're going to be lost in the last day. And my word is going to come to the witness stand and be the testimony against you um, the, and, and the proof that I gave, essentially, and the words that I spoke. So notice, uh, again, how exclusive. And we see it also in uh, the letters. Then it carries over into uh, John's other writing in his letters, the three letters attributed to him. And just one reference from, from those in 2 John 9, and I think we hear this text a lot in the church, he comes right out and says, Anyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, what, what's the concern? Does not have God. What's the conclusion? You don't have God. You don't have the teaching of Christ. You don't have God, period. Uh, but whoever abides in the teaching, you have both the Father and the Son. So your eternal destiny hangs on whether or not you will receive and remain in the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's what John's gospel comes right out and says over and over and over. And you think about how, how that is absolutely uh, in opposition to what what we see in our own culture, where you know the whole the the whole emphasis is on um, accepting, being tolerant of everyone's beliefs. That's the idea. What a contrast with the radical individualism, and uh, I guess sort of radical pluralism or the views of diversity, uh, th that term that is used to promote this idea that um, the greatest virtue is to be accepting of everything, essentially, except those who, don't, who do not accept everything as right. But it, what a contrast the writings of John 
are with the mentality that pervades in our culture. I mean, John's gospel speaks to our world. Uh, this, this environment in which we live where political correctness has uh, sort of intimidated everyone into uh, embracing and acknowledging even the most perverse and radical things as being acceptable because we have to be accepting of everything. That's not the worldview of John's gospel. That's not the Jesus that John presents to us in his gospel. And let me give you a little an, uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, every time I drive to the church building, I pass a sign for the Bay Area Unitarian Universalist Church and I had to stop the other day and take a picture of it because this is what they put on their sign. And they'll put out signs that, that boast the community virtue signaling uh, sayings on their signs that talk about how they're so supportive of, uh, of, of the murder of the unborn and of um, the homosexual agenda LGBTQ agenda and all of that. But notice what they put on their sign. That's what's up there right now. I had to stop, though, the other evening when I was coming home from the church building. Look at that. That, that idea of where we're celebrating diversity of belief. Is that, is that what you see when you read John? Say, John said, well, you know, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But, you know, other people might not believe that, and you don't have to believe it. Uh, just believe what you do because what is great and what Jesus was all about is just everyone having his own beliefs. Uh, all, just the diversity of beliefs, you see, that's what's, that's what's most important. <laughs> well, I mean, seriously, seriously. Whoops. Uh, here's a couple of others. Um, I, I love my trans-affirming Mayflower UCC church. I guess that's the, uh, un another universalist church. But it's just the idea of, um, for example, here, look at this. This has this float in a gay pride parade. And again, let me put in my disclaimer that we always uh, try to include that when, when we say homosexuality, homosexual behavior is sinful according to God's word, of course, as John presents in his gospel, for God so loved the world. God loves everyone, and we love everyone, but that does not mean we approve of all behavior. So we would love, of course, homosexual individuals as much as we'd love anyone, but according to the word of God, homosexual behavior is perverse and it's sinful in his sight and will keep us from heaven, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. But, uh, but notice here you have a church that has a float in a gay pride parade, but what's the passage they have up there from the Gospel of John, the golden text? So, for, uh, for God so loved the world. And so they're looking at that idea of love, right? as God so loved the world, um, that, that means, you know, he, whoops, that means, uh, I keep grabbing the wrong tool, doing the wrong things here, trying to talk and do this at the same time. You'd think by now I'd have this down, but I, but I don't. But that does, it doesn't highlight very well anyway. Let me circle it again. But this idea of love, see, love, that's, uh, that means God uh, accepts and we need to celebrate and embrace uh, all behavior, uh, including behavior the Bible comes right out and says is, is perverse and uh, an abomination, in fact, in the sight of God. So when I say John's gospel speaks to our culture and it is so relevant in our day, it's because you know people are abusing this idea of love as a, a being accepting of all behaviors and of all beliefs, and yet you look at John's gospel, and that's not the Jesus we find there. Jesus says, you, you don't accept my word. You reject me? You reject my sayings? 
you're going to be judged in the last day. You don't believe on the Son, you don't have life. The wrath of God abides on you. That's, that's the kind of thing that we find in the Johannine writing over and over again. But finally, and bear in mind that, yes, John is writing to convince unbelievers to believe so that they'll have life, but there is no mistake that John is also writing, he's very much writing for those who already believe, or to put it um, as Powell does in his introduction to the gospel, he makes this great statement that John is clearly devoted to confirming the faith of those who already believe, not just to convince unbelievers to believe, but writing to those who already believe, guiding them in, in understanding the implications of their faith. And that has to do with the things we've already discussed when we were looking at the sits in Lieben. You remember the context, the issues that were facing the Johannan community, what we were just talking about and talked about in the previous class, the Jewish hostility, the false uh, philosophy from the Hellenist culture, do, uh, Docetism and, and Gnosticism and all of that. He's writing to show the implications of their belief and set them in stark contrast to the errors that they were facing and warning. He's writing to warn them against being deceived. He says that explicitly in 1 John 2. I'm writing these things, I believe it's verse 23. Uh, because of those who would lead you astray, the American standard says, or those who would deceive you, I believe one translation says. But then he's writing then to warn them against being deceived, against being led astray. And so he's setting the boundaries of what constitutes acceptable belief. And he's encouraging them to trust in God and giving them assurance of victory in the face of the hostility the hatred and hostility they are facing. And there's some beautiful passages along those lines, but Jesus does come right out and say in chapter 15 to them in verse 18, verses 18 through 21, they hate me, they, they're going to hate you. But he's writing chapter 16 and verse 1, he's saying to the disciples, those who already believe in the upper room, I'm saying these things to you uh, so that you won't fall away. I mean, I'm saying these things to you so that you won't be led astray, so that you won't give up. He's trying to encourage them. I've said these things to you, chapter 16 and verse 1, to keep you from falling away. And that can be considered. I think that, that statement captures what uh, one of the reasons for the entire gospel, to keep us in Christ, so that we abide in Him, as He says in chapter 15, that we have to abide in Him. You know, when He comes right out in His prayer to the Father in chapter 17 and verse 11, and He says, Holy Father, keep them, keep them. So it's written to encourage Christians to maintain orthodoxy, to, to hold fast to the truth, and not to fall away in the face of that hostility and hatred. And so, as always, a lot more could be said on that. I know I say so much about this stuff that you'd think, what could possibly be left? But that's just some of what we could say about what I think are the principal purposes for which John wrote. And because it will only take a couple minutes, I just want to tack on here, uh, having a look at the, the purposes for which John wrote, the central theme. Instead of saying, you know, what is the theme, let's say, what, what, would, what would be the central theme of John's gospel? And we'll be looking at more themes and when we address themes in theology. But the main theme, I think, could be worded this way, and this is very similar to the way Strauss words it, but I like the way he captures it. But that Jesus is the divine Son, very important, who reveals the Father and who gives eternal life. That's a frequent term and an important emphasis in John's gospel. He gives eternal life to all who believe in him. John's gospel, remember we said, is the gospel of belief. And we'll see what he means by eternal life in this letter. But um, all of this, these are all uh, key thoughts that are central to the fourth gospel. 
And before we close, let me mention what I think um, are the key verses of John's gospel and of uh, many that we could give here. Certainly, we'd have to include the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. But uh, let's narrow it down to chapter 1, verse 1, which declares that Jesus is God, and verse 14, that he dwelt, became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 18, he's declared God, he's interpreted God, he's revealed God to us. If we're only going to give one verse, uh, of course, it would have to be, wouldn't it, uh, John 3, 16. I mean, if anyone knows just one verse in the Bible, it's John 3, 16, the golden text of Scripture as it is uh, referred to, and we see it all the time. People hold it up on signs. Uh, it's, it's, of course, a much beloved and well-known passage for good reason. Now, I, I would include verse 36 with it, you know, uh, for God so loved the world, verse 36, you know, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But then in verse 36, John says, you know, whoever believes on the son has that eternal life. But he adds, those who do not obey the son shall not see life. See, a lot of people, they, they, they love John 3.16 because it talks about having life in his name. But then a few verses later, I think it's John who's saying this at the, at the end of the chapter, a few verses later, he says, and, and, if, and if you don't believe, if you don't obey, uh, you're not going to see life. You're going to remain under the wrath of God. And then the text where John himself declares why he's writing, I'm writing these signs so that you'll believe um, that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you'll have life in his name. He comes right out in that verse. As we said, unique to John, where he just will come right out and tell you, this is why I'm writing, because I want to give you the evidence that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, and so that believing you'll have life in his name. Isn't that great that God just speaks directly to us and appeals directly to us like that uh, through, through John in his gospel and in his letters? Okay, so we're, we're done, and next time it will be very interesting to look at the distinctiveness of the Gospel of John. I know I said that's, that's coming up, but I had to make sure we included these concerns that we addressed today. So this sets a record then, one hour and 17 minutes. Uh, it's my understanding there are still some who don't know how to change the settings so they can watch the class. You can, you can get through this class in half the time. I guarantee you that you can understand just about everything I say on double speed or certainly if you put it on one and a half speed. So what I think I'm going to do is make a, a separate video or provide a link at least to a separate video if you look in the description box down below. I'll try to include that uh, to show you how to adjust the playback speed when you're watching a YouTube video on whatever device you have. It's a little bit different depending on what platform and what device you're using to watch the YouTube video. So uh, it's just a great tool and it allows you to, to get through more teaching in less time. And I think that's a good thing. And so hopefully you got through this. You didn't take a whole hour and 18 minutes to get through this. Or maybe you broke it up into a couple different study sessions. But either way, forgive, forgive my... Uh, verbosity, my OCD to try to include everything in here that I feel I need to get in. Uh, I know that's a problem and I'm working on that. Thank you for your patience and uh, grace and peace to you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Look forward to being with you again.